at some point I'm thinking, it's just a goat, boys. Nobody needs to die for this. <laughs> right? And sure enough. Oh, oh, we said that a bunch. Yeah, and sure enough, at some point, I like that you captured that discussion. We would assess the goat. We would assess the, the approachability of the goat. And then we would assess the probabilities of um, a less than ideal retrieval situation. Like you said, there's a lack of appreciation for that brotherhood or sisterhood of a love for adventure. Just for the yeah. record, I actually found it extremely refreshing. I, I actually mm-hmm. really think the way you showed it is legit. All right, folks, thanks for tuning in to the Gritty Bowman. I'm here with Adam Yonke from the Journal of Mountain Hunting. And, um, you know, I just spent the last 20 or 30 minutes watching a new uh, film that you have. You just said you didn't actually produce, but that uh, you're kind of responsible for producing, right? Yeah, I, I, sure. I, I mean, we, we actually talked about this on the hunt, you know, exactly what is my role other than the guy that, that swears in the background and, you know, has a, has a sip of whiskey around the campfire every night. And we weren't sure if I was producer or director or, you know, first grip or whatever. But um, <laughs> like, like I said, off air, um, I, my, my primary role was to make sure that um, this thing, this thing happened and then gave it to, to much more capable people to turn it into what you saw. So folks that are listening, I just finished watching the film. It's a mountain goat hunt. Uh, in some of the most epic, rugged, uh, late season country I've ever seen, and um, and the film is seriously legit. I mean, I'm fairly picky about this this stuff. Um, I don't think you should really shorten it. I liked the length of it. Um, you know, I don't want to give too much away, but you guys are are taking on. Um, a challenge against the elements that's pretty it's a pretty monumental challenge and uh you captured it very well and so what um what went into this whole film and what was the idea behind it like why why this yes (laughs) yeah that's a good question and after being on the hunt itself i i asked myself why a bunch of times as well because uh it was um we expected challenging we i guess in many ways wanted it to be just that um i mean i guess to set the stage we're talking about a a late february um goat hunt in in coastal or north coastal bc uh, about as high north as you can get in bc before you um hit alaska in fact the other side of the inlet um is alaska um and uh for you know better or worse that's my third um late season goat hunt, uh, in as many seasons. And I don't know, man, it's, um, there's something really different about trying to take on one of these challenges at that time of year, right. As, um, you know, any sort of, I mean, tough is relative, right. Any, any backcountry hunt, you know, whether that's, you know, an overnight from your truck or a multi-day excursion into new terrain, it's, it's epic in its own way. Um, but this, you know, depth of winter, you know, minus 20 Celsius for most of the trip, not the entire trip. Things kind of warmed up a little bit, but that also brought weather towards the end. Um, just everything's everything's got to go. Well, I was going to say everything's got to go right, and that's not true. You have to control everything you possibly can to have a chance at success. Right? There's not a, I mean, there's luck. There's always luck, but there's not a lot of margin for error. Right. And so um, I guess uh, on the most basic level, that's what really appealed to um, all of us that went on it on, on the hunt. The premise of the film is um, or centers around um, a good friend of mine, a guy who works with me on the journal named Nolan Osborne. And uh, he's a uh, well full time as far as you can be full time in the guiding space, but a full time mountain hunting guide is guided for you know stone sheep, mountain caribou, moose, mountain goats black bears, grizzly bears, you know, the full kit and caboodle has guided in the Yukon has guided in Northern BC. Um, and what I, I don't know if a lot of people appreciate, and maybe this is, I don't know, this, this would apply, I think to most guides is, um, a lot of guides don't get to hunt a whole lot for themselves. They spend most of the sort of huntable months guiding other people. And so Nolan, who's been doing just that, um, decided that this year it was sort of his turn. 
right? He was going to go and wanted to go on a proper mountain hunt. And the reality is that um, if you want a real deal mountain hunt, you know, five to 10 day, maybe even longer, um, true backpack style hunt in, in legit mountainous terrain, for a guide, you're not really left with a whole lot, at least in BC, right? Um, you know, if you wanted to pay to go international, sure, there's lots you could do in that regard. But, you know, for the average Joe or Jane guide that, you know, doesn't have a whole lot of dough to throw down on an international hunt, um, you're really kind of left with a late season goat hunt. And so um, Nolan had talked about it. He'd been with me um, or had accompanied me on my first um, one of these late season goat hunts uh, three years ago. Um and had always wanted to go back and just, you know, had travel plans that conflicted, family stuff that conflicted uh, until now. And then this year, this was the year that he would decided to go. And then uh, we decided to make a film about that ex- expedition. So the, the, you know, I want people to go and see the film. Right. But but so I don't want to give too much away. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we can, we can tease out lots of it. It's just, yeah. you know, there's certain elements that I, like, I think we can, I mean, I mean, the truth is Brian, sorry to cut you off, but, um, we wanted this film to be 10 to 12 minutes long. And as you said, it's going to fall somewhere around the 20 minute mark. You saw a reasonably polished, but still yet to be 100% complete version of, of what we're going to release in, in the coming weeks. Um, and we just could not cut it down any further. Right. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes was, you know, the, the, the shortest we could make it. So what what I'm going or where I'm going with that is even at 20 minutes, that's still a fraction of the experience. Right. And so, I mean, there's, there's plenty we could, we could get into or dive into. So, you know, ask away. And if I say, uh, let's, let's save it, then we'll save it. Yeah. The, well, first of all, um, what was your vision of the film going into this? Because, it's got a, it's got some distinct features mm. that I don't see in a lot of hunting video. Um, I mean, immediately you pick out. It has a, it has a tone and a feel that, um, and it, and there are things that are captured and things left out that are not typical. Well, so I'm curious to hear what those are actually. So, for example, um, you know, uh the lead up to actually so i'll tell you this in a nutshell this is why i love love the film and i'm not just saying this because we're friends um i actually if it sucked i'd tell you it sucked but yeah no I, and that, that's why that's why i sent it to you because i i trust your honesty um for me i want to see the brotherhood and the camaraderie that that hunting is i want to see the hardship and the adventure captured honestly um there's that there's a point at which I'm watching you guys climb this mountain going, yeah, at some point I'm thinking it's just a goat boys. Nobody needs to die for this. <laughs> right. And sure enough. Oh, 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 we said that a bunch. <laughs> yeah. And sure enough, at some point, I like that you captured that discussion because that's the very discussion you have. And it's going through my mind and, um, and, and it's pretty sketchy country. And so then you, you, you actually back out. Okay. And Mm -hmm. so all of that is, I love that. Then you guys don't actually show the kill shot. Nope. In the film. So, but you have it because Mm -hmm. I could tell you have it when I'm watching Mm -hmm. the film and then the actual time spent, um, you know, handling or dealing like celebrating the actual goat on the hill. It's, it's almost, it's almost not present. It's just a tiny little bit. And, so well, and, the film, and, 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 and there is just to interject for a quick second, that there's a very practical reason. I mean, there's definitely, a, let's say a, a, um, a vision or directional reason for that, for sure. Uh-huh. Um, there's no doubt there, there could have been more celebration shown in the film. Cause we, we did have, uh, some time there, not a lot. And, and really and truly it was a very practical reason for that not being a, um, a longer component of the film. Um, you can, I mean, having watched it, you heard what Nolan said just before we descended to the, to where the goat yeah. ended up uh, expiring. Um, and, and nobody was saying anything other than 
Connor sticking a camera in Nolan's face to say like, dude, what's up? Like, how do you feel right now? Like literally yeah. nobody was saying it. There was, there was six guys standing there, just everyone looking at somebody else to make the first move. Yeah. Yeah. This is a life and death situation. You guys uh, are in repeatedly. This is not, this is not uh, a walk on, uh, you know, in the woods. This is, um, this is how deep is the snow? And in, in, in parts, <laughs> I mean, uh, well, you, what you about saw that. sliding? What about avalanche? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you know, for those that you know maybe don't listen to uh, the, the Beyond the Kill podcast much, I, I Barklow, John Barklow from Sitka Gear on a couple weeks back now, or a few weeks, whatever. By the time this airs, um, and we we got into a bit of that, and so like, um, you know, look, there's there's a lot of how do I put this? There's a lot of discussion in our space about, you know, the extreme nature of what we do, right? Um, and that's cool. Like, it's true. It, at times it can be, right? Um, and so I, I don't want to, you know, pull the sort of the hero card here and make it sound like, you know, we did some crazy epic stuff. I mean, there were times when, sure, like it was, I mean, that one clip you saw, like, where we where we turned around and backed out, Um we literally could not hike down with our packs on because the slope was so steep that if our packs were on, we would have been sent tumbling uh-huh. forward. So we had, we, had to, we had to rope our packs, like we had to descend with ropes, roping our packs down a, you know, to one guy, cramp on down with the ropes, get to the packs and, and repeat and repeat and repeat until we get to the point where, you know, the grade was, was, was manageable. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, so th- there, were, there were moments like that for sure where, you know, a poor decision could have resulted in um, a, uh, a less than <laughs> desirable outcome, let's say. I don't know if you caught it in the film. Could result in what? In a less than desirable outcome. Um, so, and I don't know if you caught it in the film there, but one of the guys did fall at one point. Uh, and luckily, just at the last second, grabbed a, a little spruce branch and and sort of, you know, self-arrested enough to, to land um, with <laughs> some element of control. But he slid a good, I don't know, probably 12, 15 feet. Right. Um, and so, yeah, there there were moments like that. That the point being that there were for sure moments like that, and we did our best to um, mitigate those risks. Right. You can't control all of them, but we did our best to mitigate them. And then, no doubt, there's there's the avalanche concern. And um, you know, I, I'll be the first to admit that out of everything we did in terms of preparation, that was probably where we were. I won't say irresponsible. I'm pretty confident my wife won't listen to this, so I, I'll say, you know, we might have been a little bit irresponsible. I mean, we had guys with experience. You know, one of the guys had taken um, some avalanche training. One of the guys, uh, Stephen Drake, is is a very avid backcountry skier and has spent a lot of time in that in those sort of situations. Um, but then we had guys that were willing to take some risks that some of us. Um, weren't ready to, right? And so we, we did a really good job, um, you know, in hindsight of checking our egos, stopping and um, making the best decisions we could in the moment um, or given our responsibilities in terms of retrieval um, to to mitigate those risks. So there were times, for sure, it was tough and challenging and dangerous, but um, it, I don't want it to come across as, you know, we threw caution to the wind or we think we're, you know, some whatever badasses that can go and do whatever the hell we want and train that we shouldn't. Right. No, no. I look like there were, uh, there was a lot of, um, uh, a discussion debate, like a lot of planning that went into, uh, an ascent and, um, and some judicious decision-making when it came time to, you know, for, for people to say, to actually stop the group and say, you know what, um, we've gotten to the point where I don't feel comfortable with this anymore. Yeah. We're going to change direction and find a, 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 a different goat or a new plan or new ascent or whatever. So yeah. I know I thought it was, the story was really well told. I like what I liked about it was uh, another thing I liked about it was that it didn't emphasize the kill shot or the kill. I mean, really Adam, the film does not emphasize that much at all. Mm-hmm. Nope. And, so and in your uh, so it sounds like it's a blend of by design, but also mm-hmm. by necessity because you're up in it. You just didn't get the footage to really show some of that. 
Yeah, well, it was by design for sure. I mean, even if everything had gone perfectly and we'd had, you know, perfect circumstances and 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 gotten the Billy in in a much easier spot than we did. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, for those that know our platform, whether that's the Drill of Mountain Hunting or, or Beyond the Kill, I mean, the name of the podcast probably is sufficient <laughs> to explain why. Um, but, it, I mean, make no bones about it. We were out there to kill something. Right. I mean, right. We, we, no one in their sane or no one, no one in, you know, any version of sanity would do what we did and not want to come home successful. And this, and to be clear, when I say this was my third, those previous two had been unsuccessful. And that's, that's fine. I mean, I, yeah. I get that. Um, what still, why the direction of not showing the more of the kill shot and emphasizing the, the, the achievement of killing the goat. <sighs> You know, the, and and just for the record, just for the record, sorry to interrupt, but just for the record, I actually found it extremely refreshing. I I actually Mm -hmm. really think the way you showed it is legit. Like it's, Mm -hmm. it still got me excited and it, and it was like, oh, that's super cool. And then it got me right back into, I thought it was really well done like that. So, but I'm curious why, why not? Why not show more of that? Why not have it and be a centerpiece of the film rather than just a step in the film? Yeah, it's a great question, and and I would um I would want to give Connor Gabbett of uh, Talus Creative all credit for putting this vision together. I mean, he and I have had I couldn't even guess the number of conversations about this film in the in the planning stages on the hunt itself, and of course now that we're in we're in post production. Um. And, you know, my job is to, you know, give very loose, you know, to use a sort of a Jocko term, commander's intent on this, right? Um, and he's doing all the heavy lifting. And, and, and the way that the, the shot is, is shown, that's all him. That's all his vision. He and Stephen Drake were, were, running the, were running the cameras on this, on this trip, and they did a phenomenal, phenomenal job of capturing stuff that um, – I don't even know if I would have thought to include, right? Mm-hmm. Like that close up of, of Nolan's eye. Um, and then the yeah. shot moment itself is just epic. Like true. And I, like well I say told. that as, yeah. And I say that as, as a viewer, not as, you know, somebody that's, you know, in, in, in part behind this film. Um, I didn't, I would let, that's nothing. I said, let's do it. I gave it to him and he produced, um, what you saw. Um, so, yeah. killing like uh, goats are, are are interesting right because they're not that the story of a goat hunt typically in my opinion at least isn't what it like it isn't the moment of the kill yeah that can occur in really gnarly terrain especially if we're talking bow hunting um and to to get within bow range of a goat is, is no small feat um but the story of a goat hunt is what gets you to that moment, right? The, the challenges, the terrain, the weather, I mean, you've no business. We, we as humans have no business going where goats go, mountain goats for the most part. Yeah. Right. And so it, the, you know, the, the terrain, um, the location in this case, you know, this, this beautiful, beautiful part of BC that most of the year is one of the wettest places you can find. So not a fun place to go. Um, but in the winter, there's this special element to it, right? Um, and so we wanted to showcase, you know, the place and the, as you said, the camaraderie. And of course, you know, this this journey, this quest that was Nolan's first real mountain hunt for himself. He's been on plenty of mountain hunts, but as a guide, right? Um, and so we really wanted to show that side of it and show that, you know, we've, I mean, the guys on this hunt, so we had, Steve, we had, so in terms of the, the people we had on this hunt, and the, the reason I'm bringing this up, we had Stephen Drake, very well-known photographer, been on countless mountain hunts all around the, all around the world. Um, Connor Gabbett, um, hell of a hunter, hell of a cameraman, uh, BC guy, a uh, guy, not guide to, um, Nolan Osborne, full-time mountain guide, um, 
guy named Dan uh, who uh, works with Dustin Rowe. Dustin Rowe was on the hunt, not as a guide. He was there to actually hunt for himself. Um, that plan changed when we realized just how difficult this was going to be because he was a kind of a late addition mm-hmm. to the team. He and both he and Dan were. Um, and uh, there wasn't a single day when everybody in that group didn't look at you know the, the guy next to him and go, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> I, I remember one climb. So there's a climb. Uh, there's Nolan says we covered about 300 feet in three and a half hours um, or two and a half hours. I don't remember exactly that, that climb by the time we got to the tree line um, and there's a scene there where he's like, I am cooked. That was seven plus hours to cover 1100 feet of vertical. And so on that climb, um, at one point Dustin turns to me and we're both just dripping with sweat. It was in a re- reasonably like wind protected, basically slide and the sun was beating down. So it was cold as all get out, but, um, it just the way that the, the sun was kind of coming off the snow was actually creating a bit of an, an inversion and, and creating some, some pretty good heat where we were. So we're, we're cooking. Um, and Dustin turns to me and, and I won't, I won't use the exact language cause it's not fit for your podcast, but he looks at me and we both stopped it. This was like sort of 10, te- 10 steps and breathe, like sort of like the Everest shuffle sort of deal. Yeah. Right. Um, and not because of elevation, just because it was so darn hard. So anyways, Dustin turns to me and he's like, this is about as hard bleeping core as it can get. What were we thinking? And so, you know, when a guy like Dustin says that guy who's been on a hundred, more than a hundred sheep hunts. It's tough, right? right? And the reason it was, and the reason it was tough is like on that, you asked about the snow depths, right? So it, at points, it was literally nipple deep. And so there's a clip you saw in that film where Nolan has an avalanche shovel and he's shoveling snow out of the way just so he can lift his knee up to then pack down the snow with his snowshoe to make a step, get up onto that step and then repeat that process, right? And so it wasn't like that everywhere, but there were pockets where we were in really, really deep snow. Um, and I'd also like to make, make it really clear that this was like through and through a, um, a team effort, right? Like the, the way we had to handle the snow because there was so much of it is the guy leading and, and you know, breaking trail could only go for, depending on the, you know, the, the steepness and, and the snow depth, 15 to 30 minutes before he'd have to drop to the back next guy would break trail. And then as you get further back in the stack, right, each, the guys at the back are having an easier time. It's still hard because it's steep, but you're not busting trail. And yeah, then we just keep rotating. trail in the front and kind of like exactly. geese, geese in a flying formation. <laughs> flying V, yeah, no, we, that's what we were saying a bunch of times, it was the flying V. And, and, and legitimately, like, I don't know, I'm sure there's people out there that could do it um, solo. I don't even know, for me at least, if you could do it in a two man or two person team, like somebody, whoever breaks trail needs enough relative rest to recuperate. Otherwise you're just, you're not going to get anywhere. Right. right? And so, um, so yeah, and anyways, it was just, it was, you know, it, there was a, <laughs> there was a lot of work involved. Well, and I imagine that in that country, if, if a serious storm were to hit while you were, you know, doing something like that, that, that you could be in serious trouble. Yeah. 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 Because, and, and just from a snowpack perspective, so like coming back to your question about avalanches, that's where that gets to be pretty dicey. I mean, we had the, we had the, the equipment for sure. I mean, sorry, not the avalanche equipment, but like we had the, you know, our apparel systems, um, were, were, were dialed, right. Absolutely yeah. dialed. None of us went in, you know, sort of, uh, unprepared in that regard. Um, we had great tents, you know, we were running, four season Hilleberg tents that can handle just about anything you can throw at them. Um, but you're right. I mean, and, and there, I mean, a snowstorm could equate to three feet, right. Of yeah. snow overnight. So I think you're right. I think, uh, you know, a mountain goat hunt isn't each species, each location, there's different aspects that really stand out on certain hunting, let's call them experiences, uh, mm-hmm. adventures. And, the actual shooting of the goat really isn't the emphasis. It's, it's everything that goes around it. Yeah. And I thought that that was very well captured. And, um, 
especially, you know, there's some camaraderie there and you can feel it. And uh, Nolan's a character, dude. Like <laughs> <laughs> those bloopers at the end. Those oh, are man. Great. Those are great. Like uh, just hanging out with Nolan day in and day out. You're going to hear some. Uh, uh, he's just going to keep it real. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he's a character. He's, he's, he's a great guy. And, um, you know, he, he's, he's an interesting guy in that, you know, he's not. He, he I mean, he didn't take the, the standard path. Right. I mean, came out of school, went to college and, you know, could have could have done a lot of things. And, um, you know, he, he pursued his, his, his dream, his passion. He wanted to be a mountain hunting guide and maybe someday an outfitter. And, uh, I hope Nolan doesn't mind me speaking on his behalf in that regard, but, um, you know, he, he you know, wasn't even, it's not like he even did environmental science or something like that that's even quasi related to a life spent outdoors. Right. Um, he just, he just went for it. Right. And, um, and has been committed to that dream for as long as I've known him. That's how I met him. Um, was it was after he'd uh, made the move out west and started to to look for guiding work, wrangling work to start, of course, as most people do. Um, and uh, and so, what's really special about this 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 trip and this film was for Nolan to kind of take something back for his for himself because he's he's made a lot of sacrifices to to realize his dreams, and now he's working with one of the best outfits in BC. Um, you possibly could, um, was hired above people much older than him, much more experienced than him because he's, he's a hard worker, really hard worker, um, and, and really great with people. Um, and has a great, let's call it ethos around hunting. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's, and that's the other side of this is everybody on that trip was aligned with the goals, both in terms of what we hope to achieve, um, but also what we wanted this film to portray as well. Right. So, um, um, as you've produced this film and, and you've got it out there, uh, what are you hoping to accomplish with the film? Yeah. So that's a good question in terms of what we're trying to achieve. I mean, first I should mention that you know, doing something like this, of this, let's call it, you know, not severity, but that takes magnitude. this much time and effort. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Magnitude. Yeah. This magnitude. And then this much time and effort that goes into something like this. Um, you know, we're not doing it I mean, we are doing it for, for passion, for sure, um, but we couldn't do it without the support of uh, a number of companies. And, and those companies are Loopold, um, Gunworks, Mystery Ranch, and, and Sitka Gear. And so, you know, when you ask, you know, what do we hope to achieve? I mean, um, one, we want to portray uh, a real and raw depiction of, of what a late season goat hunt entails. Um, so that would be, you know, job number one. Job number two is, you know, we want people to see that with, you know, the right determination, the right planning and preparation, and obviously, given that list of, of sponsors, the right equipment, you can do things you probably don't think you can, right? Right. Um, and, and we really, we, we really could, I mean, look, I was going to say we couldn't have. We all know that if you read back in history and old hunting stories, there were people doing things that you know, we probably can't believe we're, we're done back then. Um, but our, and you know, our lens is, is different now. The lens through which we look, right. And, um, yeah. it would have been real tough to do what we did without, um, the best gear possible. And, and whether that was on the optics side, uh, our apparel systems, um, our packs, I mean, for goodness sakes, look at what we did to our packs on that trip. Right. Yeah. And, and when I say they were, they were roped back out, it's not like they were just, you know, softly going through nice pillowy snow. It, they were getting <laughs> the crap beat out of them. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was interesting. I was at uh, REI the other day and looking at packs in there and I'm like, if it's not like a stone glacier, a Kafaru or a mystery ranch, I'm kind of just not that excited about it. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so true. And it's, you know, look, it, 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 packs are a huge discussion, right? And um, yeah. at the end of the day, like I firmly believe having used a lot of different packs that um, it really is what fits you the best is the best option. Um, and, and then, you know, decision around, I think some people like a little bit more um, like, let's say organizational capability, you know, right. even if that's modular. And then some people really love the real simple, Sleep. you know, ultralight approach to, to things, right? Um, but they, they have to be, you know, they have to fit you well to do yeah. these sorts of things or, you know, a lot of the hunts that you do. Um, 
and they got to be able to take an absolute beating. Like at no point, I'll put it this way. At no point did any one of us go like, Oh, should we do this to our packs? It was like, no, I don't want to live today. So right. <laughs> like, right. if I had to kick my pack down the mountain, I would have. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, that's a question I, I was going to, I wanted to ask you, especially in the clothing department, you know, what, what did you learn from this trip that you didn't know before in terms of gear? What's a standout, that hmm. maybe even a standout piece of your kit that you use that, or, or maybe a layering system, um, mm-hmm. how you laced, did the boots, whatever, something that just stood out for you. Yeah. So, I mean, well, one thing, one thing that really stands out this is unrelated to, you know, apparel or layering systems is there's a very big difference between, you know, quote unquote, real crampons and then the hybrid and then, sorry, and I should be careful because hybrids an actual class of crampon. But there's, there's the, I think it's camp makes a crampon. that's basically like four spikes right under the, like the, the middle of your foot, mm-hmm. nothing on the, on the heel, nothing on the toes. Um, I've never used those myself. I've, I've seen them used. I saw them used on, on this trip, in fact. Um, and I'm sure they're great for shoulder seasons, right? Where yeah. things might get wet or slushy or you're in loose terrain, loose footing, etc. But for this sort of stuff, um, you have no business being back there if you don't have crampons or if you're somebody that, you know, knows your way around the mountains better than, you know, 99.999% of people in the world. Right. And so we had an individual on this trip who was running those more simple crampons, um, that if he wasn't who he was and didn't have the capabilities that he did would have been sitting in the Valley waiting for us to come back down. Cause it was, you knew you needed toe picks. You needed, um, you know, the, the aggressive heel, heel points. Um, so that's a standard, like you just can't do it without that. Um, yeah. On on the gear side of things, I talked about this on the on the podcast with with Barclow, but this was my first real. I'm not gonna by no means am I am I gonna say throwing caution to the wind, but my first real like I have I'm gonna put all my trust in you know Barclow's rewarming system or process, right? The the proper application of a layering system, the proper materials within that layering system to manage moisture and manage, um, you know, my own, my own, you know, survivability or body heat. Right. Um, and, and I've, I've been playing around with that for a good bit of time now over a year and, you know, experimenting here and there, but this was the first, you know, extended duration hunt where I didn't pack anything extra apparel wise. Right. I had no, I had no what ifs, right. As Barkley will say, what, what if weighs a lot, right. I had no, I, I had no what ifs. It was right. all, ex, you know, expressly um, packed and used for the purpose. Uh, for the purpose, yeah. no redundant items. Zero, zero. Yeah. Um, so I mean, th- th- there's a bunch of things. I mean, if you want me to get into exactly what that gear list is, I'm I'd be happy to do so. Um, I, I'd have to pull up my notes. They're not too far away. I'd have to pull up my notes, but. Um, one of the standout pieces of that kit is their new or was their new, um, Kelvin heavyweight puffy. Um, the, the, the real, like the, the so-called sleeping bag that you wear. Right. Right. Um, right. And that was, uh, some of the first field use, um, amongst our group with, with that version, which has the windstopper outer. Um, cause the, the old, the previous version, um, didn't have that, that wind stopper, um, outer laminate. Right. 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 And, and I'll be honest and say that if, and the reason that's a standard is, is when one of the guys mentioned it to me and there's a bit of a story why I ended up with one on, but we'll, maybe we'll get there. Maybe we won't. Um, but one of the guys mentioned this to me. I actually didn't have one. I, I had a, uh, let's say a TP tent mishap with my um, previous version of the puffy that ended up with a, uh, a non-functional jacket by the end of it. Um, so luckily one of the guys had packed extra. Uh-huh. Um, and so they, they gave me this, this, this new version. Um, and I, when they gave it to me, I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. Like how much better can it be? Right. Uh-huh. Um, and it was remarkable at how much more effective, uh, a jacket that was for that, that, you know, that maximal insulation, uh, outer right. layer. Um, because we'd be, you know, we'd, we'd be busting our butts to hike, 
you know, and bus trail, even just in the valley bottom, we're going through, you know, knee to thigh deep snow. Um, and then we'd sit in glass, right? So you're, you're cooking and then it's minus 20 Celsius. And so you gotta, you better layer up. Right. Um, and, uh, I'd been in my older version of the, of the jacket in the earlier part of the trip and I ended up in this, this newer version, uh, in the second half of the trip. And it was a marked difference, right? Where, where, where other guys that didn't have one, would, you know, sit for 10 minutes and go like, okay, let's get moving again. Uh, I'd just be toasty, toasty, warm and fine. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's a, you know, as somebody that, how do I put this? Um, that thinks really carefully about the gear I use and, mm-hmm. and, and spend money on. Um, I probably wouldn't have gone for that option, that model, you the new model. I would not have, no. Um, just on spec. Right. But after trying it, uh, it's a no brainer. <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, uh, it's an absolute no brainer. I would say this. Um, I have used, I have not used that jacket, uh, but I have a go-to jacket that I use all the time, which is the Kafaru Lost Park Parka. Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. traditionally Sika didn't have like a windstopper puffy layer right. of right. that magnitude. And I find myself putting, uh, using the Kafaru as my, that, sure. that bomb proof wind proof piece of mm-hmm. gear that I put on top. So I'm all, I'm, ex, I'm going to try this sick of, uh, the sick of piece because, um, to see how it compares, because that is, that's one of those layering pieces that I didn't have from Sitka. Yeah. And there's a huge difference between wind stopper and no wind stopper. Yeah. Like the Kafaru Parka, one of the reasons it's, is warm and as useful as it is, is because there's wind stopper in it and right. the wind just cannot cut through it at all. Yeah. And I don't think people realize how much the wind, how critical that is. The wind can rob you of, of so much of your warmth. Um, having that wind stopper layer is a big deal. Yeah. Um, traditionally like Barclow and I talked about this and he talked about how he'll wear the wind stopper layer next to skin almost and then put the puffy on the outside of it because it breathes very well being the closer that windstopper layer is to your, to your body, the more the heat transfer can, can pass through yet it still blocks the wind and keeps you warm. Very uh, curious how this, cause I, my concern, like the Kafaru, I don't really move in it unless it's extremely sure. cold because yep. it's really a stationary piece. It's for just yep. standing mm-hmm. around. You wear it. If you're going to move in it, you're going to sweat. Did you yep. experience that with this from Sitka? Or? Oh, I, I never moved in it. Like I, 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 I followed the, well, and look, and when we talk about this whole notion of, of a rewarming, uh, you know, system or process, uh, there's no nature to it, right? Some people run warm or hot. Some yeah. people are, are profuse sweaters, right? And others yeah. are not, um, knowing, you know, how my body responds to various layers of insulation. And and clearly, you know, when I mentioned this was the third hunt, having refined this over previous late season hunts, I knew what would work for me and what didn't. So that was that that jacket specifically for me was only a sitting glass or you know, in camp at night and first thing in the morning. Right. Um, and the rest of the time I was layering, you know, from, from, you know, the, the, um, the lightweight next to skin stuff up to the midweight layers. And then, you know, things like the, the waterproof, um, breathable, like the hard layer shell top or bottom as needed. Right. So it was, yeah. there, there's a lot of work to it, right. Like to, to be clear, it's not like you picked your outfit in the morning, like you're going to the office and that's what you're in. Right. There's, there's a lot of Right. And I think especially in this in this situation, there's a lot of time that has to go into managing your internal environment relative to the external environment. Right. So if you're busting trail through snow, that's thigh deep. You don't want to be wearing uh, a permeable pant. Right. Right. Uh, I, at least I certainly didn't, um, because now you're, you've got moisture on the inside from sweat, moisture on the outside from the snow you're not going to get, you're not going to dry out. Right. And you're not going to breathe properly. Um, so there, there's, you know, that when I talked about the, you know, the, the margin of error earlier, like that's not to sound all fancy. It's, it's actually kind of boring really because like every little decision has to be you know, sort of thought through because it, because it can result in, you know, at, at best, you know, un, you know, uncomfortable, 
you know, situation, right? You're cold, you're wet, you, you know, you're shivering, that sort of thing. Or at worst, um, you know, you can start to flirt with things like hypothermia and that sort of stuff, right? Um, and so it's those little details, right? It's like, it's like when people talk about shooting, right? It's actually really boring to practice the fundamentals of shooting. It's not going out and, you know, if you're a rifle guy or gal, right. ringing steel or slinging arrows at 60 to 100 yards and stacking them up and playing the Robin Hood game. It's a lot of really boring fundamentals, right? And the same mentality applies to how you manage the, you know, your whole, your, you know, from, well, I was going to say from getting up to going to bed, even, even your sleep system becomes critically important in this sort of an right. environment. Yep, absolutely. Um, how did the uh, Leupold stuff hand, uh, stand out? Oh man, so we um, we were really really lucky in a lot of ways. Um, Leupold was gracious enough to bring us down to their uh, Leupold Optics Academy back in January to um, put us through. It, well, I guess the only way I can put it, essentially, a custom version of a couple of their courses, and custom only because we had, it had to be condensed. Um, right. And so, you know, if, if you're listening to this and you're both a bow hunter and a rifle hunter uh, and don't know what the Leupold Optics Academy is, um, go on their website, check it out. They've got some amazing courses. Um, and um, and they blended basically two of those courses together to give us this, this sort of private and custom course. Um, this was Nolan's first um, you know, formal instruction in um, precision long-range shooting. Um, and so he, because he was obviously the main character in the film, uh, was going to be the, the, the trigger puller. Um, was doing the bulk of the, or receiving the bulk of the instruction. My role, uh, and really the only reason you see me in the film at all, is uh, I was playing the spotter role, which is something that Leupold focuses on um, pretty heavily in the in their curriculum, is that is that shooter-spotter relationship. Um, and so we went down there, we had absolutely incredible instruction from the guys that, that, that run the, the LOA. Um, and uh, they... Um, put uh, a new Mark V HD um, 3D18 scope on the rifle and um, Nolan, you know, got, got the rifle and the, the optic fit exactly to his, um, you know, body geometry. And it just, it performed incredibly, incredibly well. And uh, the, one of the fun things for me as the spotter is they, they actually um, built us a custom spotting scope with a reticle in it which you can get on the, on the tactical side of their, of their line. Um, but not a lot of hunters go that route, right? They're, they're going to get a, a spotter that can just let them, you know, see as much as possible. Right. right. Um, and so what was really cool about having that is, is, you know, in, in line with this shooter spotter relationship is in the event of a miss, you are speaking the exact same language. You're essentially looking at the exact same site picture, right? Wow. So let, let's say Nolan takes a shot at whatever. And we, you know, we were doing this on the range, right? So let's, we practiced frankly all the way up to 1200 meters. Um, knowing that we would never take a shot that far, but when you shoot that far, you know, three to 400 yards becomes a, a chip shot, right? It's, it's, it's right. sort of an afterthought. Um, but you know, we'd be working on these targets, picking out targets and calling range, um, you know, calling his, his dope is his, his elevation. And what was really cool is we had some pretty windy conditions. And so um, my job is to kind of, well, it's a bit of a dark art, but there is a science to it as well, but but figuring out the wind side of things. Mm-hmm. And of course, that <laughs> that didn't go so well at first. And, you know, with more reps, things got better. But point being, like, let's say he missed um, three inches to the left, right? This would be the conventional ways, you know, t- you know a buddy system might work. Um, because I'm looking through that spotter with the reticle, um, I'm calling not, to, you know, I'm not sitting there going, uh, dude, yeah, three inches left, right? It's, I can call it exactly to the mill what the miss was. He, by the time, like by the end of the course, I could barely finish saying that and he will have corrected his point of aim and, you know, ding center ring, you know, dead goat, um, type of, uh, you know, scenario. So, I mean, I know to a bow hunter, this maybe sounds super foreign to you. Um, but it was a really, really, I'd never used a system like that before where the, you know, the spotting scope and the rifle essentially are, are not one and the same, but they are inextricably linked. Right. Um, and that was incredible. So the instruction was incredible. The equipment was incredible, um, in, in that sort of a scenario. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, again, it would have been hard to get it done if we hadn't had the equipment that we did. Right. 
Well, that's pretty cool. I actually have done uh, last this last year. I did a couple of uh, rifle hunts, and ironically, I ended up killing you know a bear and a and a whitetail within bow nice. range, um, like eighteen yards and fifty <laughs> yards. And yeah. I'm like, dang it, where's my bow? But um, but I've been enjoying the rifle hunts quite a bit. And then I went with my 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 um, best friend and his son. He had a youth mm-hmm. tag and rifle hunted. Um, I I think it's it's uh, I I think for me, you know, it's about the challenge, the adventure. Mm-hmm. And what you did uh, wasn't close range uh, when you guys took that goat. Nope. Um, but it came with other challenges yeah. that I think it doesn't matter whether you're shooting with a crossbow or a bow and arrow or a recurve or a compound or a rifle. It's all, it's still, we're all in that same brotherhood. It's all that adventure all, yeah. all tied into one. Yeah, no, and it's, you know, you and I were talking about this a bit before we went on air, right? Is, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll more than admit that I th- this is probably so front of mind for me right now because we're working through this film that involves a goat taken at what most people would consider to be long range. Um, it's not extreme, right? But definitely outside the, the realm of the average shot. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, through this process and just through the natural order of things of, of, you know, my work, have conversations with bow hunters and that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, I, I'll admit, I get a little bit frustrated at, at some of this infighting, you know, like you said, whether it's crossbow to compound or compound to trad or bows in general to the rifle people bows in general to the long range people the you know the the traditional rifle and i don't mean black powder i mean people that think you know 300 yards is is the limit for an ethical rifle shot to those that that you know can do more than that and ethically it just frustrates the hell in me right because the, the there's this like you said there's a lack of appreciation for you know that brotherhood or sisterhood of a love for adventure Right. And of pushing your limits. And again, that's relative. Right. I mean, Mm -hmm. for me, taking a 60 yard bow shot because I haven't picked up a bow in months um, would be long range. Right. Right. Um, For me to go and pick up that rifle and take a six to eight hundred yard rifle shot, it's long range. But I'd feel a lot more comfortable about that on the on the balance of ethics than I would with a 60 yard bow shot, to be honest. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And like you said, what goes into the hunt right to that moment whether it's you know setting that back or you know using back tension to send the arrow or you know getting into 15 yards with your self bow um or whatever like it's all cool what i what what i really get disappointed with is that lack of appreciation for each other's methods and how what goes into becoming proficient at those methods Right. right. Like yeah. I, 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 sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say there. There's. Um, it's. It's a topic of discussion that comes up quite a bit um, because I don't think there should be a um, us against them thing going on within our. And a lot of that's just uh, you know it's it's just uh, virtue signaling. It's hey I'm better than this guy because yeah, I hunt yeah. with a trad bow so therefore I'm a better human being. I give you know then you've got the guy that shoots a rifle, I'm more ethical because I use a rifle and it's more efficient killing machine. And it, it just, but at the end of the day, um, yeah, I'd like to see a lot more just brotherhood in this and, and support uh, and celebration of each other's hunts. That's why this film, I think does that it, whether you're a bow hunter or a rifle hunter, this film is uh, excellent. It just brings people together. It's, it's what, it's what hunting is about really and captured well. Um, on another note, I want to ask you, uh, cause I did a film on a goat hunt, my yep. la- goat hunt from last year and, um, Aaron's goat fell 2000 feet off of a, a straight drop. I mean, yeah. and it was yeah. a bag of bones when it got to the bottom. And mm-hmm. I discussed that in the film. It's a very real, yeah. um, um, challenge when you're hunting goats yeah. is can you recover the goat? Mm-hmm. You know, and especially I would say when you're shooting longer range with a rifle, um, I just because you could because you can reach out and hit one, you can poke out there far, so you could be like, mm-hmm. "Yep, 
you, you can be looking at a goat and going, yep, I can kill that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you can recover it. No, absolutely not. And so how did you guys um, tell me a little bit about that challenge and what you did about it? Hmm. That's a really good question. So um, we we scoured. So, I mean, I'm sure I would think it would come as no surprise to everyone that, you know, this was a glass them from the bottom and get up there and see what you can pull off. Right. Sort of thing. Um, one of the reasons, and this is just a bit of a side sidebar, but it's important to note. One of the reasons people hunt goats in the late season is in theory, they should be lower, right? The, the thinking is that the snowpack drives them down into more timbered areas, which you know, might be two thirds to halfway down, maybe even lower. I know guys who've, um, you know, taken goats like you know, literally from the trail and the goats right. are, you know, a couple hundred feet above them. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's the prevailing wisdom. Now, if you talk to guides and outfitters that, you know, no goats inside and out, they'll say that's actually not true except in November. When they're in the rut, when the first snows hit, that's what drives them down. But then once things harden up and there's a pretty stable snowpack, they just go back to where they want to be anyways and frankly have to go up higher to find windswept bridges where they can actually get some decent food. Now, that doesn't apply everywhere, right? But I've seen this in BC um, pretty consistently. Yep. So the, the reason that's important is we would be, of course, glassing from the valley bottoms after, you know, hiking hours into wherever we were going. Um, and we're talking like minimum of four spotting scopes scouring everything, right? From, you know, giant 95 mil objectives down to, you know, 60 mil objectives. Um, so we would thoroughly assess not just the GOAT, right? Cause we were after a Billy. Um, it is legal to shoot an Annie in BC, but that was a, a, sh- a non-starter for us. Um, as long as it's not with kids. Um, but so we would assess the goat. We would assess the, the approachability of the goat. And then we would assess the probabilities of, um, a less than ideal retrieval situation, right? Now you can't do that perfectly from the Valley bottom. If there are, you know, a ways away. Um, but we did our best and there were certainly situations where we would see a goat and just say, Nope, can't get to it and certainly can't shoot it. Right. So that, I mean, that, that's, that's the sort of the first bar we had to clear for the goat that is in the film. Um, I'll admit that, um, we, uh, what, (laughs) what looked, um, I can't say ideal. That's it was far from ideal, um, but manageable from the bottom was very different when we got up there. Um, <laughs> right. You do the best you can, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and look, I mean, and this is where, sure. I mean, if you, well, this is a really interesting one because I've thought about this a ton, right? So I, what I was going to say there is sure. If you were a bow hunter, you would have had to get into a position where you had a total assessment of, you know, the viability of, of the train in terms of retrieval. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. but I can guarantee you that if you were a bow hunter and had tried to take the Billy that we were after in this film, um, you would have lost that Billy guarantee it Yeah. because of the terrain. So it, it's a, it's an interesting one, right? So, so to back it up. So as you said, the shot was not close, mm-hmm. um, not extreme, but not close, you know, pretty much smack into the bell curve of, of, you know, from quote unquote normal to true right. long range, I, I would right. say. Um, and from the angle we had on the Billy, um, it looked like there was a ridge line in front of us. And then the Billy was on this sort of peak and ridge ridge. I use that term lo- loosely given how steep it was, but, um, this bluff ridge sort of blend thing, um, on the other side of this, this ridge line that was in the foreground. And from the bottom, that looked like a little, I don't know, like a little shoot, but a pretty mild, you know, navigable shoot. Yeah. Um, well, we get over there and it's, it's vertical. It's, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a small canyon, right? And so um, if the goat had not expired the way it did, he would have been lost. 
without a doubt. Right. Yeah. So I'm not going to sit here and say that the thought didn't run through my mind that like, Oh shoot. Like what if, what if he hit him poorly? What if whatever, right? Here's the thing, you know, when I published the film of my go hunt, Aaron, Aaron was criticized by a number of people who felt that, you know, because it fell 2000 feet, he shouldn't have shot that. First of all, getting in bow range of a goat, um, when there really is not very many, we weren't in an area where there was just a goat around every corner, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he found one, it was stockable, which we'd seen goat for a few days, but there was nothing stockable. It was like climbing the face of the empire state building. You're not going to get that goat, (laughs) you know? No. And so here's one that's stockable. Aaron gets in position and he has to make a call. Mm -hmm. And literally the difference between that thing dying up, up where, where it wouldn't fall at all and falling 2000 feet was literally two inches. Mm -hmm. That goat expired, laid there and, 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 and died. And it looked like sweet. Now we're going to go get the goat. And then it slid a little bit Mm -hmm. and then one laid slid and then it fell 2000 feet. Yeah. Just if, if things were just a hair off a different way, or if he had just walked a little bit further before he sat down mm-hmm. after being shot, there wouldn't even have been a discussion about this goat fall. Yeah. And, but you can't control all those factors. So at some point you have to make a decision. How am I going to do this? Yeah. And you know, the truth is, Brian, that um, you know goats are notorious for those sort of outcomes. They are. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to try and pull the wool over people's eyes, right? Um, they they live in, I think, it's the most inhospitable terrain available to the North Without American hunter. As I said earlier, we really don't, you know, <laughs> we really don't belong where they exist, right? Right. Uh, it's it's like, it's kind of like the, the land version of hunting sharks. Like, you have no business being there. Right? Not that anybody hunts sharks, but I'm just you know using an extreme example. Um, and look, like, I don't want to make that sound all like, hey, look how extreme this is. It's just they they, you know, what's the 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 saying that the goat guides all say, you know, um, if if you're if you're hunting sheep and see goats, look down, right? And I've heard other ones say, you know, big Billy spit on spit on sheep, right? Mm-hmm. Because they live above them typically. Right. Not always, but typically. So where I'm going with that is, um, by by definition, the odds of um, a less than perfect outcome, i.e., an animal falling or being lost outright, are unfortunately higher with goats than with, say, elk or mule deer or even sheep for that matter. Um, and I think as the hunter, you just have to go in willing to um, accept that. But at the same time, do absolutely everything in your power and control, as you said, every variable that you can to um, mitigate the chances of that happening. Right. So right. Like in, in the case of Nolan's Billy, um, did you catch the finish? Do you, do, do you think you have an idea of where that goat was shot? I'd have to watch it again. OK, watch the end again and see if you can pick it up. Um, so, you know, hint, hint, tease, tease to people listening watch the finish closely. Um, he could not have died quicker. Like literally it was, it was a lights out scenario. Yeah. Right. Um, and, um, where he was, there was vegetation. Um, and the odds were quite high because of the, 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 the thickness of the vegetation that he was going to, going to get hung up. Right. Right. Um, right. Now, you know, would we make a million dollar bet on that? Probably not, right? right? But on day eight of nine days of hunting, after going through what we went through, it was, it was a risk we were willing to take. And with the equipment we had and the guys we had, we were confident that we, if it went wrong, um, we wouldn't be completely hooped, right? Yeah. Now, if he'd yeah. gone down into the chute, I don't know if we would have got him. Right. The um, thing is, is uh, at the end of the day, um, I, I shot a, um, you know, I've sh- I, I shot an animal last year through some thick brush and it was just the last three feet up to the animal looked like I had a little window and I punched it through there and, 
And um, there are going to be a lot of folks who would, a lot of hunters who would say, yep, I'm not taking that shot. And I, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm not there to judge whether they should or shouldn't. That's a personal choice. Mm-hmm. I think at the end of the day though, every single shot that hunters take, especially, um, I mean, it, you're, you, it's just every shot boils down to often less than perfect scenario. Yep. And I think uh, even more so with a bow and arrow, where often it's in close quarters, it's in the last few moments, things are, you know, you got to make a split decision. It's yeah. not like you can sit and wait at 300 yards and decide and wait for an animal to, 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 to pose for you or something. I think it can really, and, and uh, I just think you do the best you can mitigate mm-hmm. those, those risks the best you can. But at the end of the day, um, you got to make a call and make a choice. And if you're, if you're, you do the best you can. I, I just like that you showed what you showed and, and, and it is, you know, it is just as real as it can be. You know? Yeah. Well, and I guess to close the loop on what I was saying earlier, um, I, I appreciate that uh, you know, immensely, Brian. And, and I know the rest of the guys will too, but, um, you know, to close the loop on the retrieval thing, you know, Aaron taking heat, that sort of stuff is, <clears throat> I really don't want this to come across as, you know, like an overbearing comment to those that haven't hunted goats before. Cause it's not, it's not the intent, um, at all. It's, um, goats aren't hard to find good, good goats, like good billies yeah. are no, but goats aren't hard to find. They're really hard to kill. Right. right? That's what I said in my film. I'm like, you can find a goat every hour. Yeah. Like on the, yeah. as a white speck up on top of a cliff and, and, and when i say kill i mean I, that that's like not kill it and leave it like that's the hunter's version of kill like kill retrieve and take home right um mm-hmm. and so if you haven't done it i would just say maybe you know pause on hitting send on the dm or the comment on socials or the email criticizing it because um the variables are such that um there's just you know, stuff happens, right? I don't, I, I, I don't go through a year of, I know a good number of guides in BC that are either they guide on goats because of the challenge. Um, they don't have lost stories. And that's a sad thing. Like I don't, I don't want that to come across oh. as cavalier and a, a lack of respect for the animals. I, in fact, if, if there's, if there's any animal I love, there's no animal I love to hunt more, to be honest, yeah. than goats. Um, and, um, you know, I've got lots of other things I want to hunt, but if I had to do one hunt every, if I could only do one hunt every year for the rest of my life, it would be for mountain goats with, without a doubt. Um, because they, it is, it, they're uh, badass, dude. Like, uh, yeah. And it's, it's a challenge, right? It's a challenge. It's, it's a, and, and they're they super, in... they're just a, such a cool animal. Like they, they are, I don't think they, they get the love they deserve because no. they, they just don't have the bone on the head no, the way that everything else yeah. does. But I, I have a thing for goats. Everybody knows me knows that I think goats are awesome. And I was, this is my first goat hunt last year that I was able to ever hunt a goat and, or be on a goat hunt at all. And, um, I'm just as hooked as ever. I'm just fascinated by goats. They're just, they're unreal. They're yeah. great. They're incredible animals. Yeah, they really are. No, no other animal can survive in, in the terrain and climates that they do, right? No other animal. There's a reason, you know, there's such a thing as goat country, right? Yeah. You don't see a lot of other things up there, right? Other than birds. Yeah. Well, Adam, uh, I know you, you don't quite have a title for the film yet, so I can't say everybody go watch blah, blah film. Yeah. Well, no, we, we've got a few titles to be clear. It's yeah. just, it's not been added to the version or the edit that you saw yet. So we're, we're, we're finalizing that one. That's one of those ones. It's, you know, uh, yeah, it's like, you know, about, when you're uh, a release date. Uh, yeah. So release date, it's going to, so th- we're recording this. What, what's the date today? The eighth, May eighth. Yep, yeah. May 8th. It's going to come out within a month. Let's put it at that. Okay. All right. Um, so it's maybe sooner, uh, if we're lucky, but I would say, you know, bank on somewhere in the three to four week vicinity. Um, and, uh, 
few reasons for that, which you know I won't bore the audience with. But um, you, like I said at the outset, you you saw essentially an 80% version. We have some spit and polish to put on it, um, and some final elements that we want to make sure we feel we just feel right about, right? I mean, I, I did, you know, truly appreciate your thoughts on, on the film, Brian. It means a lot. Um, but, uh, because of the situation, right? It is, you know, it's a long range shot that, you know, comes with, I think a, just a certain responsibility, right? We want to represent that well and represent the story of what went into that well, which isn't always the case when it comes to that you know, I was going to say community, I'm part of it, but that side of what's shown in, in, you know, let's say hunting videos or films, right. Is, um, sometimes the whole experience can get missed for in, in lieu of the emphasis on that, on that yeah. shot. Right. Yeah. No, it's great. It's an excellent film. I'm excited to, to point more people to it when it comes out and see it again. It, um, it's well done, man. Well done. I, I think, I think it's a, it does a service for hunters. Um, among both the hunting and the non-hunting community. It's a great film. So kudos on that. And as soon as it's out, I'll be sure and share it uh, through Gritty. And, well, that's... Um, yeah, great, well done. Well, I appreciate that, man. And, you know, it, it's funny because you asked me a question earlier about, you know, what did we hope to achieve? And as you're going through that, when you say you feel like it does a service to hunters, um, that's probably the best thing a person could say. Um, to, to the group of us, I think is we hope that people see this, that are new to hunting, curious about hunting. I hey, don't get me wrong. If you're as hardcore as it gets, you're going to like this. <laughs> oh, you are. Uh, I, I, I promise, promise you that. Um, but I also hope that people that, you know, don't know a whole lot about hunting, get a chance to see this, um, and see some of the things, you know, we talked about here is that it's, you know, the kill is, is obviously why we go to do these things, but it's not the only reason. Um, and there's a lot that goes into these sort of trips, like most trips, but especially this sort of a trip, um, that, um, I think will, uh, appeal to those that, you know, might not otherwise want to see a rifle based goat hunt. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Adam, thanks for joining cool, me. Man. Thanks for sharing so, this. Oh, no, my, my pleasure, man. Thank you for your time. So I, what I would say though, is if people, you know, aren't, aren't, you know, aware or, you know, don't follow our platform with any regularity, but do want to, you know, find out as soon as the film comes out, obviously, you know, we're going to get people like yourself, um, gracious enough to, to share it as uh, on our behalf, which is phenomenal, but you can follow us on Instagram at journal of mountain hunting, uh, which is at journal underscore MTN N as in November underscore hunting. Um, we'll send out um, some uh, email notifications to the Journal of Mountain Hunting list. So if you want to stay fully up to speed, go to journalmountainhunting.com. Check that out. We are likely going to have some, let's say, incentives um, put out there as well. Some some fun stuff for people to maybe get their hands on. But uh, you'll have to you're just going to have to tune in to what we got going on to find out more about that. Excellent. That's awesome. Cool. All right, Adam. Thanks, man. All right. Take care. Stay yeah. gritty, guys. Hey, you too, man. Bye-bye. Bye. Despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator, pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself.
What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>